Uh, let me read a passage of Scripture to you today from the chapter where the song came from in the Bible. You ever read the book of Revelation? Amen. It's a powerful, powerful book. You know, there's a lot in the book of Revelation when you read it. We're not going to get into a eschological, uh, technological study here about future events and all that, but... You know, the first chapter, it talks about some of the things that were before. And then he says the things that are, that's Revelation 2 and 3, and the things to come, that's the rest of the book. And if you don't get that straight, you got the church in the tribulation. But trust me, trust the Bible. You are not going to be here in the tribulation. Amen? Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you shall have, in, in me you have peace, but in this world you shall have tribulation not the great tribulation. That's just day-to-day -day trials and, and challenges that you face in life. Amen? And so, anyway, Revelation chapter 5. I'll read the passage. You may remain seated here for that. Revelation chapter 5. And I'm going to read the chapter to you. Then I'm going to say a few words here today. And of course, today we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, as I've already said a few moments ago before the special that we just sang, amen, this is, listen, this is what it's all about. Without it, this is waste. Let's, let's sell the church. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> amen, this is worthless. It's absolutely worthless what we're doing here. It's all in vain, but it's not. Amen, the Bible's true. You can trust the Bible. And so Revelation chapter 5, and I saw... In the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within, and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book, to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, hmm, how about that? Right. Nor in earth, that's where we're at. Amen, how about this? Neither under the earth. Come on, that kind of covers everything. Right. <laughs> Where else are you going to go? Was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Here's John the Apostle. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's been banished. Amen. They already tried to kill him, put him in a boiling pot of oil, and he lived through that. How about that? Amen. Here he is. God gives him this revelation here. And the Bible says here, and he wept much, verse 4, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Aren't you glad? Listen, God, listen God's got the power today. He can do anything. He set these events in, in place. He did this. God did this. And he says, they said this, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Amen. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, capital L. Hey, that's Jesus. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, when he came to the waters of Jordan. And then the Bible teaches us that John said this, he must increase, I must decrease. And he got out of the way, and he let God continue on. He was the forerunner of Christ. He prepared the way of the Lord, amen? And so he's the lamb. Jesus is the lamb as it had been slain. See, we got all these ideas. You might have a Bible with pictures, and I'm not trying to be overcritical of that, but the reality is, Listen, if you study the Bible, the Bible, listen, when Jesus was on that cross, Isaiah 52 says his visage was marred. It was beyond the sons of man. You know what? It even tells us in Isaiah 52 and 53 that if you saw him, you would not desire him. Right. See, the world focuses on visual appearance in the sense, oh, that person looks beautiful and that one looks ugly. How about that? And listen, if you went based upon appearance, people, listen, people would not have come to Christ. It wasn't about his appearance. It was about who he is. It's all about Jesus. And the Bible says it was as a lamb that had been slain. If you read Zechariah, 
He says the wounds, you know, he's going to come to the nation of Israel again. Amen. And he says, these are the wounds that he suffered in the house of his friends, the Bible says. Right. Amen. They're wounds. They're not scars. They're not healed over. They'll be as fresh the day when we see them that they were on the cross. They have not changed in these last 2,000 years. And he says, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that had sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Listen, we're all going to be singing the same songs up in heaven. And you won't need a songbook anymore. Hey, man. And you won't need something on a screen or anything like that. We're all going to be singing a new song, not the old song. Amen. Get used to singing the new songs of Zion. Amen. And the Bible says, what song are they singing? I wonder how this verse went. We just sang a rendition of, rendition of these words that someone wrote here. And they're good words. They're based upon the scripture. And it sounds good. Amen. I don't know what the tune's going to be in heaven. But he says here that thou, verse 9, are worthy to take the book. This is the song. And to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation. That kind of covers all ground. Hey Amen. We got things beneath, things above, things on earth, and now we got every, you, However you want to categorize yourself here, you're in that list. According to God. Maybe not the world doesn't identify you that way, but God does. That's how God identifies. Amen. And then he says, verse 10, and thou hast made us our, uh, unto us our God as kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Praise God. You're a saint of God. You know Christ the Savior. You have, pers you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God says you're going to, you are, again, there's other places throughout the book of Revelation. He says we are kings and priests unto him. That's what the Bible teaches. And we shall reign on this earth. There's going to be a thousand year millennial kingdom. Amen. Praise God. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. King Jesus is in charge. You don't have to vote anymore. You don't have to put that little X in that circle on a piece of paper and fold it up and have them hand it and put it in a box. No such thing anymore someday. Praise God. He's in charge. He's going to rule and reign, the Bible says, with a rod of iron. I love, I want that kind of rule. I want Jesus to rule and reign. That's not happening yet. Have you noticed? <laughs> if you haven't noticed, we got some problems here. You better get back in the Bible because you don't know what is good and evil anymore. Have you lost touch with that? Have you lost touch with what is right and what is wrong? The Bible says, verse 11, Behold, I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and a number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You say, well, I, I think I can figure out the number. You can't. That's just a way of saying you can't count them. That's what that's telling you. You can't count them. We can't put a number on them. Amen. And then he says this, saying with a loud voice, watch this, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, just in case you didn't get it the first time in the beginning of the chapter, amen? And he says, watch this. And uh, not only that, he says, but such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb. Who's on the throne? God is on the throne. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father. Unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, amen. So be it. That's what amen. So be it. Amen. Not wrong to say amen. I know I say it a lot in my messages. I know. So I mean, it keeps on saying amen. 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 It's true. It's true. It is so. Amen. The Bible says so. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Praise God. Well, listen, we got to ask ourselves a question. Who's worthy? He is. And let me ask you this. Is he worthy? 
in order for you to understand this question, you need to understand something. You need to, first of all, ask yourself this question. Sometimes we focus on what God wants us to do. Before you answer that question, you need to answer the question, who is he? Not the what, but the who. Do you know who he is? Do you know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? Do you understand that? Are you saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And listen, if you're saved, he's your savior. You've trusted him in, in what he did on the cross. You're not trusting in your good works and a baptism. You're not trusting any of that stuff. It's just by, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And that not of yourselves. Amen. Listen, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You can't work for it. You can't deserve it. You can't earn it. That covers everything. Right. He died. Listen, if you could earn it, you can circumvent Christ. You can go around Jesus without going through Christ. The Bible tells us in Paul's letter to Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. Jesus Christ. Not baptism, not church membership, not being a good person. These things come after salvation. Amen? You need Christ. Who is he? Who is he today? Who is he? You need to ask yourself that question. Jesus came unto them in Matthew 16, 13. Coach of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter answers in three verses, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. That's who he is. That's who he is. You need to ask yourself that question. See, throughout the Bible, we, we went through the Life of Christ study on Wednesday nights, and uh, we finished that up. And in there, we were in that chapter, uh, in that chapter where the, on the road to Emmaus and those disciples, and they were walking with Jesus and didn't even know that was Jesus. I love that. Sometimes, listen, listen, some of us, some of us can be just like those disciples. Amen. We're, we're, we're so consumed with the events of today like they were about, oh, he died, he's gone, he's dead. No, he's alive. He's alive. And what they did was, you know, they started saying all this stuff and says, oh, haven't you heard? They still don't know it's Jesus. And finally, through a process of talking, and then the Bible says he opens up the scriptures from Genesis right through to Malachi, and he shows about himself, all the things concerning him. So I'd love to have been at that Bible study. Hey, man, you can set aside all the scholars out there. They got all these books and everything, and there's a lot of good stuff out there, but you can't beat what Jesus would have said on that road to Emmaus. And then the Bible says he started to do that. Well, this is not that message, but let me just share with you. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb that was slain. In Leviticus, he's the high priest of God. In Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the fire by night, guiding you step by step in your life. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of your salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and the lawgiver. In Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer. In First and, first and Second Samuel, he's the prophet of the Lord. In First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra, he's the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken down walls. In Esther, he's the savior of the helpless. In, in, in Job, he's the sovereign God over human pain. In Psalms, he's the good shepherd. In Proverbs, he's wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the meaning of life. In Song of Solomon, he's the lover of our souls. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the rejected messenger of the Lord. In Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the turning wheel. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Hosea, he's the faithful bridegroom married to the unfaithful wife. In Joel, he's the spirit in the fire. In Amos, he's the burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's the mighty savior. In Jonah, he's the merciful and forgiving God. Oh, praise God for that. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's people. In Habakkuk, he's the great evangelist crying for revival. In Zephaniah, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Haggai, he's the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, he's the merciful father. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. I love that verse. Amen. Rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he's the savior king. 
And Mark, he's the Savior servant. And Luke, he's the Son of Man. And John, he's God the Son and the Son of God. And Acts, he's the risen Lord. And Romans, he's the justifier of sinners. And First and Second Corinthians, he's the giver of the gifts of the Spirit. And Galatians, he's the giver of freedom for the believer. In Ephesians, he's the unsearchable riches of God. In Philippians, he's the God who meets our every need. In Colossians, he's the image of the invisible God. In First and Thess Second Thessalonians, he's the returning king. In First and Second Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man, as I've already said. In title, in Titus, he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood that washes away sin. In James, he is the great physician. In First and Second Peter, he's the chief shepherd. In First, Second, and Third John, he's the everlasting love. In Jude, he is the Lord who comes down with thousands upon ten thousands of saints. And in Re Revelation, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he's the only one who is worthy, according to verse 12, to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing. No one else on planet Earth. No one else but Jesus. That's the one. That's the one that rose from that tomb that day, today, as we celebrate. Amen. Is he worthy? Listen, let me ask you some questions, okay? If you can establish the who, you can do the what. Whatever God wants you to do, you can handle that if you know who you are worshiping and who your God is. You can do that. Is he worthy of the cost and sacrifice that you might have to make in life, in your time and your talents? Unfortunately, between the world, the flesh, and the devil... These elements that we face on a daily basis have this ability to reduce the worth of God. Even as in the garden, where Satan is questioning Adam and is questioning Eve in that conversation about God. Oh no, oh you're not you're not gonna die. Don't listen to God. And you know what? He does he's holding back something from you. Hey, he's reducing the worth of the value of God. That's what the devil wants to do. You know how he keeps people lost? The Bible tells us in Romans 2, 4, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know what? If you can show people, if you can convince people that God is not good, people won't come to repentance in Jesus Christ. That's what's going on. But he, listen, you're saved. He can't change the direction of your soul, but he can surely wreak havoc in your mind. He can cause you to doubt some things. Amen? He can do that. Oh, he loves doing that. This word that we use, worthy, that we sang, the word worth, it's a level at which someone or something deserves to be valued in your life. Where, where do you put Jesus Christ on the value system? Where is he on your value system? Listen, if there's only one in the book of Revelation that's worthy, I think he's got to be way at the top there. As a matter of fact, in Paul's letter um, to the church at Coloss, he says that he deserves the preeminence. That means there's no other room for anybody else or anything else. He needs to be first place in your life. Even Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Down through the centuries, throughout the word of God and in church history, people who have understood who he is did not, did not even flinch at the what. When I think about the Hebrew midwives in the book of Exodus, they said, the government says, kill those boys, kill those baby boys. They're a baby boy and they're from a Hebrew, kill them. They said, well, no, we're not going to do that. They stood because they, know, they knew the who. Amen. They were able to follow God and say, no, we're not going to murder life. We're not going to murder it coming out of the womb. We're not going to murder life in the womb. Amen. That's murder according to the Bible. Moses, he made a decision. He knew the who. It was at that burning bush. Amen. It was at that burning bush. And God called him to go deliver the people of Israel. Amen. He says, Lord, who am I going to say who sent me? He said, uh, the God speaks through that burning bush says, I am that I am, the great I am. That's who he is. It's the great I am that called Moses. Because you know what? He knew the who. 
And it's easy to do the what if you know the who today. Do you know who he is? Amen. David in 1 Samuel 7. I love this. I love that chapter. I haven't, I've said many times I've got to write a book. I got the notes, but I don't, haven't put it in print yet. That all the earth may know him. When he's staring that giant in the face and King Saul's behind him, the Bible says he was higher than any man in the na nation of Israel. He was a rugged man, a big man. He had an armor bearer. Come on. And they're all shaking in their boots because of the giant Goliath. David, a young man, probably around 17 years of age, what does he do? He sees what's going on. You know what? I say this so many times to the kids. Don't ever take a simple little errand that your parents give you lightly. He was sent to bring bread and cheese for his brothers. It was a simple errand. Well, they don't want to do that. You better do that. You never know what God might do with you. He went out in that battlefield, and there's the Philistines with the giant taunting, blaspheming God and the people of God, and this young man sees what's going on. And his brothers see, what are you doing here? And they criticize him, and he hears what's going on. And he says, is there not a cause, anybody? Is there not a cause? Isn't there a purpose and reason for our existence as believers? Amen. And David says this, and I'll read the passage to you. I love, I got to read this. Amen. In 1 Samuel 17, if you got a Bible, great. If not, just listen, just listen. Amen. Focus on what God's trying to talk to your heart about. And again, are, do you know the who today? What is it? Listen, you're saved today. You say, pastor, I'm really struggling. I'm not saying you don't know the who, but that should come easily. The what comes after that. Now watch this. He says there, they ask him, they said, what are you doing here? And then he says, watch this, as he's approached that, that giant there, amen. He looks at him, and he says this in verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver thee, he's pointed to that giant, into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Now watch this, here's his reason and his purpose for doing what he's doing. It's not about himself. It's not about him. It's a bigger cause. And he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. People don't know God today. This world needs to know God. Have you noticed that many people don't know God? They don't know the God of the Bible. If they do know a God, they think they got this weird, twisted, perverted view of the God of the Bible. They're not an actual portrayal of God as defined by the scriptures. They got some kind of God that's like a genie or like a Santa Claus who gives you everything you want. That doesn't happen. Then when people get saved and they got this perverted view of God, they get all discouraged and disappointed when things don't go their way. Listen, problems come in life. They come. Challenges come. Trials come. Job said, hey, if you're born a woman, your life is full of trouble. Not just a little bit, full of trouble. You got a cup full of trouble. Just because you were born of your mama. How about that? Amen. That's what Job said. God says, I'll give you peace. I'll give you joy. I'll give you strength. Amen. I'll give you contentment in the midst of trials. You know what you say? That's impossible. No, it isn't. Paul had it, and he was a believer. And we got all his epistles that show us how we can do that. Maybe you need to get back to the Bible and read some more to help you. And then when he was all done with saying that, and he looked back, you know, this people here, the assembly of Israel behind them, they're shaking in their boots. And verse 47, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It's the Lord's battle. It's for God. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you. That's what David, he knew the who. It was easy to step up to the plate and say, here am I, amen. That's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 6. When he got a glimpse of God and uh, the Bible says that the king, amen, uh, died and, it, you know, he was probably discouraged, amen, you know, because that was my leader, amen, King Uzziah, you know, and uh, the Bible says the Lord gave him a glimpse of, of God on the throne and when it was all done, he said, Lord, if we could just see God, see ourselves the way God sees us, we would be more repentant. Hey, man, oh, I'm telling you. We'd examine our hearts and say, man, i got to weed out some things in my life. God, help me. 
God, forgive me. Amen. Oh, our standard is some worldly standard, not a biblical one. But when he's all done and said, he says, who the Lord says, who will go for us? And Isaiah says the famous statement, here am I, send me. You know why? He knew the who. And it's easy to do the what if you know who you're serving and who is worthy today. Oh, then we got Daniel. Man, we got good old Daniel. Amen. Daniel's three Hebrews. They, the, they, you know what they had? I have a whole thing on my blog. If you go through our church uh, website, you'll see it, the blog. And uh, anyway, um, it musings in the word. And I have this one about Babylonian brainwashing techniques. I wrote that. I don't know. I can't remember the date. It's been a long time. We're living in that day. When they took these Hebrews, when the Babylonians came in, took them captive, they took the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and they started doing all kinds of techniques to brainwash them. They, they changed their clothing, they changed their names, they tried to change their diet, but there were some men here who knew, wait a minute, I'm a Jew, I'm not supposed to eat this stuff that's being presented to me. And they said no. You know why? Because they knew the who. Hey, kids, can I talk to you today? Young people, young adults here. Listen, do you understand something? Just because you're removed from this crowd, Christians, and just because you're removed from home, and maybe you're out there somewhere, can you just not forget that who you serve today? Who is your God today? Oh, have you forgotten? He sees everything you're doing. Just because you think, oh, wait a minute, my mama don't see me, and my daddy don't see me, and my brothers and sisters don't see me, but God does. You're not looking up enough. You keep on looking horizontal all the time. These men stood up for God even though they were ripped away from their families. They did the unpopular thing. Do you know why? you know how they did that? Because they knew the who before they did the what. Oh, come on today. What about later on the three Hebrews, amen, that wouldn't bow down to that image, amen? He says, anybody doesn't bow down to that image, they're going in that fiery furnace. What happened? Those three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hey, listen, they knew the who. And you know what? Because of that, they were ready for the what. And the what was this? You're going to have to suffer for your faith. And they were thrown in that fiery furnace. And you know what the Bible says? That they, they said, whether God delivers us or not, he's still God. He's still the who. He's still the who. He hasn't changed. We want a guaranteed outcome, some of us. Well, God, listen, I'll serve you if you do this. God, I'll, I'll do this if you do that. See, you don't put any, anything, no, no, listen, you just got to say, God, I'm going to serve you. End of story, regardless of what happens. Man, I'll tell you, we're just, we got to examine our own hearts. And those, those men, they were in that fiery furnace. And you only find this in the King James. They, all the other translations change that. They said the form was the fourth of the Son of God. He's with you in the fire. Not the sons of the God. Well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, all those guys, they didn't know who they were talking about. I'm, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Listen, not only that, Daniel, Daniel 6, he was put to the test. Those princes were jealous of him. What happened? They said, you know what, we can't find any fault. We're just jealous. The king has given them an elevated position in the kingdom. And man, we just, we don't hate, we hate them. We're just envious and jealous. So they say, hey, king, we need to make up a law that no one can pray for 30 days. And they made up that law, and they said, you know what? I think we're going to trip up Daniel because we can count on Daniel praying. Did you get that? I wonder if we can count on you praying. I wonder if you would have gotten in trouble or would have you just stopped praying altogether. And the Bible says he did as he did aforetime, meaning this. It was his custom. It wasn't, how can I say it? It was a Jewish custom that you pray evening, morning, and at noon. Three times a day, three times a prayer. I would dare say, listen, listen. you're saying we have to do that? Oh, but do you pray? Do you pray? I don't believe Daniel's prayer was vain, but he says as soon as he knew the writing was signed, he knew the law that says you can't pray, what did he do? He prayed. They found him praying. They arrested him. They threw him in the den of lions. The king was really struggling with that one. Daniel, he didn't want to put him in there. 
in that den of lions. Oh, he couldn't sleep that night, the king. <laughs> Daniel's been put in the lion's den. But those lions, those hungry, hungry lions, didn't even touch him. They didn't take a nib on him or anything, and he lived through that. He made it through that. Everyone else would have been torn to pieces. You know what? Daniel knew the who, so he could do the what. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know what else? I'll give you a little list here again. According to tradition, these men, the apostles, followers of Christ, they knew the who. This is the only reason who is worthy today. Listen, it was because we read about Matthew. He, he suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword in a distant city of Ethiopia. He knew the who, so the what came naturally. Mark expired in Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. He knew the who, therefore he could do the what. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in Greece. And John was put in that cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner. And afterward was banished to, at the Isle of Patmos. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downward. Why? These men, they knew the who. They knew the who. See, we think, oh, that's the past. You know, that's the way we don't have Christians like that. Yes, there's people in this world that are suffering and paying the ultimate price for their, for their faith. Amen. We don't see it because it's out of sight, out of mind. And sometimes we may read about it. There's people out there. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem, Acts 12. James the Less was thrown from a lofty pinnacle at the temple, then beaten to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through his body with a lance. And uh, in India, and Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned, then beheaded. Barnabas of the Gentiles was stoned to death at Salonika. And Paul, after various tortures, persecutions, he was beheaded at Rome by Nero. In his last letter, Amen. He says, "I finished my course." These men knew who is worthy. They know the who. And because of the who, they, they were able to do the what. Oh, oh. Is he worthy enough to surrender whatever he asks of you today? Is he worthy enough for you to step out of your comfort zone and serve him today? He ought to be. I love that song Francis Havergal wrote. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed that thou mightst ransom be. And quickened from the dead. She wrote, I gave, I gave my life for thee, the Lord said. Amen. What hast thou done for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou done for me? The second stanza goes like this. My father's house of I Think of Jesus Christ. Amen. My glory circled throne. I left for earthly night. For wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all for thee, for thee, for us. He did it for us. Hast thou left out for me? What have you left for him? Third stanza goes, I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell, of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I born, I've borne it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? If you know the who, you can do the what. Amen. And last verse. And I have brought to thee down from my home above salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? You know what? You have a relationship. Listen, you can't earn your salvation. We're not talking about that. But do you appreciate, is he not worthy today? Don't you appreciate what you have in Jesus Christ today? Or have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that today? He's worth it. He's worthy today. Oh, I read this and I thought I'd share this. You need to decide 
if he's worthy enough for you to surrender whatever he asks of you, is he worthy? Well, he gave up heaven, as we've just read in that song, so you can get there. He was rich for our, but for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. That's what he did. We can't comprehend, this one wrote, what it meant for him to do that. He came down from heaven where he was honored and worshiped as God, walked on streets of gold, lived in mansions. He came here and became homeless. The Son of Man, the Bible says, hath not where to lay his head. He is worthy. He rode on the clouds. Then he came here. He borrowed a donkey. He is worthy. He owned the universe, and when he died, all he had was what he had on his back. He is worthy. He was worshipped in heaven. They spit on him here. He is worthy. He wore a crown up there. He wore a crown of thorns down here too. He is worthy. He is worthy today. You know, when they did this thing, when they, they buffeted him, the Bible says. You know, the Bible says that when they did that, they put a hood over his head. And they hit him. And he couldn't see it coming. And he couldn't brace himself for it. Hey, he's worthy. He did it for you and for me. Do you know what he did on that cross? He took enough for you that God had no judgment left for you. All of God's judgment was poured out on Christ on the cross. He is worthy. The Bible says that he prayed, let this cup pass from me. The cup was not the cross. There was something far greater he was about to experience than the nails, the spear, the crown, the cat or nine tails, and the suffocation. For the first time in his eternal existence, he was about to be shunned by the Father. He had always been in perfect fellowship with the Father and the Father with him. He had never done anything to bring any kind of strife or separation between the two of them. But as he hung on that cross, he said, my God... My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you? Why have you turned your back on me? He did it for someone like you and me. Amen. Maybe you didn't love God. You didn't maybe care about Jesus Christ. Maybe you never read the Bible. Maybe you never prayed before, but God in his love punished his son for me and you. He is worthy. He's worthy. And after saying this, he comes back. <clears throat> he comes back and says, I'd like to be worshipped by someone from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Would you give so that I could be worshipped? Oh, give of your time, your talents, and your treasure. Oh, Go to Acts chapter 9. We're wrapping up here. Acts chapter 9. We've got to wrap up. Do you know what the question? Do you know the question? It's the who, not the what. If you know who he is, the what comes easy. Do you know him today? Yeah. Well, I know about him. I didn't ask that. Do you know him in a relational way? Have you received him as your personal savior? Amen. Have you put your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Oh, look at Acts chapter 9. Here is the conversion of Saul. Are you ready? This is when Saul got saved. The Bible tells us in his, in his epistles, the Bible says that he was, um, as far as the law was concerned, you read his testimony in the book of Acts three different times, the Bible says he was blameless. That's what God wrote. He was blameless. That doesn't mean sinless. As far as the people could look at him, they couldn't find fault in him in that way. But later in his epistles, he said, after I got saved, I realized something. As a Jew, I was a blasphemer because he did not believe Jesus was God until that day on the road to Damascus. Can you imagine that? But you know where it all started? There was, listen now, two questions, one by God and one by him. This is, this is the big question I'm asking you. Amen today? Look at this. So the Bible says in verse 3, And as he journeyed, came near Damascus, suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. 
<clears throat> and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Verse 5, and he said, are you ready? What's the first word? Who art thou, Lord? Who? He had to ask that question first. Who is he to you? He's the son of the living God. He's the Christ. Amen. He's the one who died on the cross. He's the one who rose again. And he said, so who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. But the first time in his life, he's been turning people over to die and to be stoned and to be persecuted because they were preaching Jesus. And now on the road to Damascus, God's just given him a revelation. He realizes who he is. He realized for the first time in his life, growing up as a faithful Jew, who is this person? Who is he? It's Jesus. I've been, I've been persecuted. Listen. You're saved today. All those who know Christ as Savior, you're part of the family of God. When you persecute one, you persecute another. We're all part of that same family if you're saved today. He says, it's me. We're the body of Christ, the Bible says. And then he says this. Are you ready? Okay, he asked the right question. Is that right? But here, he trembling, verse 6. And astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He had to understand the who first before he understood to know, well, what is it you want me to do, Lord? Do you know what that is for you if you're saved? Maybe today you haven't answered the first question. Maybe you haven't resolved that matter. Listen, we'll have an invitation. I didn't put that on. We didn't put that on there, but we'll sing an invitation, and we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. But before we do that, let me read something to you. Around 1860, there was a great revival in Wales, England. As a result of this, many missionaries came from England to northeast India Northeast India to spread the gospel. We have a man that's come here. He's from Nagaland. This place where I'm going to read about is near Nagaland, in the northeast part of India. <clears throat> this region was known as Assam and comprised hundreds of tribes. The tribal commu communities were quite primitive and aggressive. The tribesmen were also called headhunters because of a social custom which required the male members of the community to collect as many heads as possible. A man's strength and ability to protect his wife was assessed by the number of heads he had collected. Can you imagine that? Therefore, a youth of mar marriageable age would try and collect as many heads as possible and hang them on the walls of their house. The more heads a man had, the more eligible he was considered. And to this hostile and aggressive community came a group of Welsh missionaries spreading the message of love, peace, and hope of Jesus Christ. Naturally, they were not welcomed. One Welsh missionary finally succeeding in converting a man, his wife, and two children. This man's faith proved contagious, and many villagers began to accept Christianity. Angry, the village chief summoned all the villagers. He then called the family who had first converted to renounce their faith in public or face execution. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the man sung his reply, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, he sang. Enraged at the refusal of the man, the chief ordered the archers to arrow down the two children. As the boys lay on the ground, the chief asked, Will you deny your faith? You have lost both of your children. You will lose your wife also. The man replied again, saying, 
Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. The chief was beside himself with fury and ordered his wife to be killed. In a moment, she joined her two children in death. And now he asked for the last time, I will give you one more opportunity to deny your faith and live. In the faith of death, this man's song, the cross before me, the world behind me. Amen. No turning back. No turning back. He was shot dead like the rest of the family. But with their deaths, a miracle took place. The chief who had ordered the killings was moved by the faith of the man. He wondered, why should this man, his wife, and two children die for a man who lived in a faraway land on another continent some 2,000 years ago? There must be something supernatural, some supernatural power behind this family. And I too want that supernatural power. In a spontaneous confession of faith, he declared, I too belong to Jesus Christ. When the crowd heard this from the mouth of their chief, the whole village accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Boy, I tell you, that's pretty rough, isn't it? A missionary knew the who. The people that got saved knew the who. Now the chief understand who the who is. Do you know the who? If you know the who, have you said to him, like Paul, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? There's something for you to do if you're saved. Let's all stand. I'll pray, and then we're going to sing an invitation song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I don't know what number that is. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, for those who don't know you today, help them to open their eyes, open their hearts to 